your first time here, I want to welcome you uh, and introduce myself. My name is Aníbal, and I'm the pastor here. And if it's your first time here with us, man, I'm so glad that you're here with us in this special day. It's an honor to have you, and um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, music is over, but the fun's just getting started. The real fun starts afterwards, right? This is going to get tense. No, I'm just kidding. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, for centuries after the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus, um, Christians developed this uh, this tradition, almost like a, um, uh, it was the way that they said hello to each other. If you know anything about, you know, the church history and, and everything, you know that um, the church has been persecuted a lot. Christians were persecuted, all within the divine plan of God to, to disperse the church and spread the gospel throughout all the known world at the time. But in the middle of trials, in the middle of problems, in the middle of, of persecution, Christians would encourage one another by greeting each other in this fashion. They would say, hey, Christ is risen. Christ is risen. And that was the way they greeted each other. So one person would say, Christ is risen. And the other person would say, he's risen indeed. Amen. So we're going to do that real quick. I'm just going to say Christ is risen. And I, I don't want to have to say let's try it again. So let's just do it with gusto. Let's do it with enthusiasm. I want to say that today we are celebrating that Christ is risen. He's risen. He has risen indeed. Amen. I'll, I'll let you get away with that one. Today in this Easter Sunday, we are um, starting a, a message series, which we have titled or I have titled. Uh, God never said that and the um, the intent and what we're going to be doing in this series if, if again if this is your first time we normally teach uh, the uh, message series meaning that we take a topic we take a verse a text or a story um, and then we just kind of study it from different angles for about two three four six weeks at a time and we attack it from different angles so that you know, it kind of applies to everybody. So in this series, God Never Said That, what we're doing is we are going to study um, common cultural phrases, common uh, cultural sayings that, uh, that a lot of people say, that a lot of people actually believe that they are true, when in reality, God never said those things, right? Uh, and it's going to be a really fun, it's going to be a very challenging, it's going to be a very practical series. So other than today, know that we do this every Sunday, right? I mean, we're not going to have Easter egg hunts and stuff every Sunday, you know, relax. But uh, we do this every Sunday at 4 p.m. Um, and uh, and we are a multicultural church. We're, we're a bilingual church, as you have already noticed. We are a, Latin, a Hispanic church in English. However that makes sense to you, that's what we are. That's who we are as an identity. And, um, and anyway, so I invite you to be part of this series because... Um, again, it's going to be challenging, it's going to be very practical, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So today we're going to start this series with this very relevant, um, just kind of declaration, this really relevant cultural um, belief, right? You have definitely heard it. Maybe you have even said this phrase or this, this uh, uh, you know, this saying. Uh, and it, actually, you might even believe it. You might even believe the fact that, hey, it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're sincere, right? So we want to shed some light um, onto this and see, well, what, what does the Bible actually say? That does it say that you can believe whatever about spirituality, about eternity, whatever about God, and then you would be okay? Or is there something specific, right? So um, it's to, that, that declaration uh, is very common today because people, man, I mean, we want it our way, right? I mean, we go to McDonald's, we go to Burger King, I don't know about you, but I'm picky, and I'm like, hey, I want that without this and without the other, and we, we like our things our own way. And when it comes to God, we also want the Bible, we want spirituality, we want these things, we want it our way. Hey, hold the judgment, hold the, uh, right, hold the, the, the faithfulness, hold the generosity. I just want what's convenient for me, right? So we actually want to see what does the Bible say, because this thing, this belief that, hey, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you're sincere, is what some have kind of coined the phrase, calling it, um, feel good theology. 
And it's true, it feels good, right? I mean, it feels good to say it doesn't really matter, right? I mean, it sounds almost right that God is so powerful and God is so loving that it really doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter really what you do as long as you are sincere in your, your just kind of pursue or whatever, um, then, then you would be fine. Now, to start today, I want to show just a couple of statistics just to kind of lay a foundation. So, for example, this, this belief um, is, is so very common that 53% of American adults, so this is American adults, people living in the United States today, 53% believe that if a person is generally good, they'll go to heaven. If you're generally good, you know, you don't steal, you don't kill, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't do really bad things. If you're just generally a good person, 53% of Americans today believe that you will go to heaven. Now, 43% of born-again Christians, born-again Christians, believe that it doesn't matter what religious faith you follow because all faiths, they kind of teach similar principles about life, right? They, you know, they might use different terminology. They might use different things here and there, right? They, they might, you know, call this differently or, you know, different things. But, but they're all just generally the same thing. So it doesn't matter what religious faith you follow because they all teach similar lessons about life. And then number three um, is that 57%. My computer is uh, freezing here. Trent, if you can click that for me. 57% of evangelical church members. So we're getting a little bit more specific here. Um, so these are people that are in Christian churches that claim to teach the Bible. Um, and uh, it, it says that 57% of evangelical church members, they believe that many religions, many religions can lead to eternal life. Many religions. So, um, I don't want to uh, insult your intelligence. Sorry, it's not, it's not working. So again, I, I'm not trying to be insensitive. I'm not trying to insult you. If this is, if this is kind of where you fall, 53%, 43%, 57%, those are big percentages. I mean, in a room this size, I, I have no doubt that maybe some of you landed here. So again, I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm not trying to be insensitive. I'm just trying to lay a foundation of relevancy of why it is important for us to talk about this fact. For us to talk about, well, is it is it really just whatever? Or, or is there something specific that I should believe or that I should be in? Now, what's interesting to me is that in our culture today, basic spirituality is not offensive or controversial at all, right? Basic spirituality is not controversial today. What I mean by that is that uh, if you watch any sporting event, any championship, any award show, people will get up and the first thing they do is, oh, I wanna dedicate this to God and praise God and amen. And, and you watch you know, daytime TV, people can talk about God. People can talk about spirituality. People can talk about supernatural experiences. I mean, they can talk about higher power. You can talk about all those things, and it's fine. Nobody has a problem with it. As a matter of fact, people eat it up. They love it, right? They, they, they eat it up, and they really like it. But what, when is it that things get controversial? <clears throat> When is it that they shut off the sound, they change the channel, they cut to, right? Somebody else, when, when? When somebody talks about Jesus. Why is that? Have you ever wondered that? Why is it that when you bring up the name of Jesus, it's so controversial? And I submit to you that the reason is because of the declaration that Jesus made. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Trey, I'm going to just recite and then you manage that for me because this thing is uh, uh, freezing up. Jesus said, hey, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he says, no one can come to the Father except through me. Nobody gets to the Father except through me. This is exclusive to Jesus. Nobody else said this. This statement was said from Jesus. And this was sets Jesus apart from any other religion. This is what sets Christianity apart from every other belief system, every other doctrine worldwide, right? So this exclusive claim comes 
from Jesus, and it sets Christianity apart from everything else. So now that we have kind of laid a foundation, I want to pause and give you today's message in a sentence. If you're, this is your home church, you know that every week I share with you one sentence, one thought, or one idea, so that if you leave here today and you don't remember anything else that I say, if you check out, if you got to go out because of an emergency, you got to pick up your kid, or if you simply get bored, I want you to walk out here remembering this. I want you to remember that the truth might cost you something, all right? Truth might cost you something, but a lie could cost you everything, all right? So today's thought is that the truth, it might cost you. That's the truth. And you can apply this to not just Christianity, religion, spirituality. You can apply this to anything. Hey, the truth can cost you, but a lie could cost you even more. Amen? So with that said, I just want to pray so that we can then just kind of jump into our study today. And you might be like, what? He's been preaching for 10 minutes. He ain't even started yet. Uh, and it's okay. It will, we'll be fine. All right? Let us pray. Uh, we're, long prayer today. All right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Speak through your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So to continue to, um, to lay this foundation, today I want to talk openly um, about um, some of the most common or the, the, the most common world religions of, of today. Um, so, of course, today of all days, our technology is not really working, but um, we, um, there, there's been, uh, let me see. Okay, here we go. Um, because of the statistics that we've already shared and everything, somebody came up with, with this kind of idea to say, that um, all religions are fundamentally the same and simply superficially different, right? And through the percentages that we just looked at and everything, um, we can see how, how that kind of makes sense. Now, I will be the first to admit that there might be, or that there is, some beauty, right? I'll be the first to admit that there's beauty and truth, some beauty and some truth, in, in many religions and many different belief systems and doctrines, I'll be the first to admit that there is some beauty and some truth in many religions, but that doesn't mean that they are all true. Now, just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, most world religions today believe that life is sacred, right? That's something that just kind of worldwide, just kind of, hey, just the, the miracle of life just this, this being just growing in, the, in another human being, then birthing it, and, and people believe that, that life is sacred. That's something that's, that's general on most world religions. Another thing is that, to put it in layman's terms, um, many religions believe that this tangible and physical world is not all there is. They believe in that there's something more, right? That there's something more after this life. That there is a, another realm of spirituality. Things that we can't see, but that are very much real. That's the reason why, um, you know, if you watch, you know, these discovery channels where they go to super, like, deep in the jungle, in the most rural place, away from any type of civilization. And even in those places, they, they practice their own rituals, they have their own spirituality, they have their, 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 their different diff things and spirits and, and different things. Why? Because innately, the human being, you know, the, the Bible tells us that God planted eternity in the heart of man, right? So innately, we know, hey, this, this physical and tangible world is not all there is. And most world religions kind of believe that. And also, in, in many world religions, there's consistency in morality, right? And, and how to treat other people, and how to be kind and generous, and, and how to be, be, be pure in thought and mind, and, and sexually pure, and all these different things. So again, I will be the first to admit that there, there is some beauty and some truth in many different belief systems and religions, but that doesn't mean that they're all true, right? That's the reason why, again, some people might say that all religions are fundamentally the same and superficially different. 
But I love this quote. You might already read it because I got ahead of myself, right? This quote by Ravi Zacharias. He is a um, apologist, theologian, and he says, as a matter of fact, it's not that most religions are fundamentally the same and just superficially different. Actually, most religions are fundamentally different. And at best, at best, they're superficially similar. So just to give you an example of this, um, I just want to go through some of the most common world religions. For example, Buddhism, they don't believe in a God. Buddhism, the Buddhism they don't have a God. Um, they don't believe in any type of final existence. Um, they just believe in, in countless rebirths. They just, you know, you finish one life, you start another through reincarnation. And the goal for them is to eventually end that cycle of rebirth through, uh, you know, ecstasy or, you know, whatever um, it, it is that they call it. So um, Hinduism, on the other hand, they do have a God, but it's an impersonal God. Like you can't just go up to that God. You can have a relationship with that God. That God is impersonal, impersonal. And the only way for you to access that God is through other idols and deities and statues and all of these other things. Now, now Buddhism and Hinduism, they do not offer, uh, offer any type of forgiveness of sins. They don't offer forgiveness of sins. The best they have to offer is karma. Hey, if you do good things, then good things will happen to you, right? If you do bad things, then hey, watch out because bad things are coming your way. Buddhism and Hinduism, different in their ways, they don't offer forgiveness, only karma. Now, if you take then Islam, the Muslim God, Allah, he is a personal God, right? He's a personal God. There are no secondary gods, and there's a total ban on all idols, unlike Hinduism, right? So there, there's a difference there. Now, this is important because you're standing before Allah. You're standing before Allah depends on your religious devotion faithfulness and your works it depends on you on how good how faithful you are and that's how you determine how good and what you deserve before Allah now take new age new age again no God no personal God they believe more like in a the, the human beings reaching a higher consciousness and the goal again is to become one with the cosmos or or one with the universe Again, a lot of big differences there. Um, Christianity, on the other hand, has a God, a personal God, so personal, in fact, that he, he showed us his love personally, tangibly, and physically through the person and work of Jesus. Christianity offers supernatural help through the Holy Spirit and offers forgiveness of sins. And, and this forgiveness of sins and you're standing before God, it does not depend on your works. It does not depend on your merit, but it's out of the love, the goodness, and the mercy and grace of God. So looking at this objectively, looking at all these different religions, all these different belief systems, if you look at it objectively, Buddhism says that there is no God. Jesus says, I am God. Hey, I'll be the first to admit that there is some beauty and there might be some truth in many world religions, but it doesn't mean that they are all the same. And it definitely doesn't mean that they are all true, right? I mean, that would be like saying, you know, oh, well, as long as you're sincere, that would be me like saying, hey, well, why don't you give me a call this week? And you might say, okay, well, I don't have your number. It's like, well, I mean, it doesn't matter my number. Just, I mean, if you grab the phone and you dial and you just have, if you just sincerely believe that young, you're going to reach me on the other side of that phone, then just dial whatever number. It doesn't matter. Just dial whatever number. And if you sincerely believe that I'm going to pick up on the other side, what's going to happen? You ain't going to call me. I don't know who you're going to call, but you're not going to call me, right? You're, you're very, probably not going to reach me. So again, when somebody says, hey, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Your first reaction should be, well, first of all, God never said that. And second of all, that just kind of doesn't seem right. Now, I want to state the obvious and say that I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. And you might say, well, yeah, I mean, you're a Christian, so obviously your position is biased. 
and, and that's fair. That's a fair, um, you know, comment. But what I would ask you to do, regardless of what you believe, I, I respect what you believe, and you respect what I believe, regardless of what you believe, today, in this Easter Sunday, I implore you, and, and, and the whole idea of this whole activity today is for us to tell you, hey, consider, consider Jesus. Consider Jesus. Now, with that, let me give you a couple of disclaimers. I'm not telling you to consider our church. That's not what I'm saying, right? Don't consider our church. As a matter of fact, I'm not telling you to consider a Christian denomination. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying consider Baptist or consider Pentecostal or consider Methodist. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to consider Jesus. As a matter of fact, I'm not asking you to even consider Christianity. Because I will argue that Jesus didn't come to establish a religion. He came to show the love of God to people that were in need. So I would ask you to consider Jesus. I'm definitely not asking you to consider the behavior of people that call themselves Christians. Please don't do that, right? I heard that. I love the way this pastor put it. He says, you know, there are two reasons why uh, people don't become Christians. Reason number one is because they've never met a Christian, right? They've just never met one. And the second reason is because they've met a Christian, right? They've met a Christian, and, and that's the truth. I mean, you might meet someone who claims to be a Christian, and they are, I mean, they're just loving and genuine and full of grace, and they're just generous, and, and they're just a joy to be around. And, and, and if you're not a Christian, you might say, man, I don't believe what he believes. But if, if, if that's what Christianity is, I mean, that's, he's a good representative of Christianity. But on the same hand, the other side of that coin, you might meet that same day, just around the corner. You might meet another person who claims to be a Christian. And they might be the most narrow-minded, egotistical, hateful, and judgmental person that you have ever talked to. So please, do not consider people who claim to be Christians. All I'm asking you today is to consider Jesus. Amen. Consider Jesus. So to do that, I want to ask you today to consider four aspects of the life of Jesus. And we're going to go through these relatively quick, quick, quick. Um, so first of all, I would, I would ask you to consider the teachings of Jesus. I would ask you to consider the teachings of of Jesus because hey maybe you don't have a background coming to church you don't have a background in Christianity you don't know much about it um, or maybe you don't like the church you don't like Christians you're just a bunch of hypocrites and it's true we are but who is it right so um, but but when you look at the teachings of Jesus you have to admit you have to be honest with yourself that the teachings of Jesus I mean they were beautiful they are beautiful They're, his teachings are otherworldly Right? I mean, I could have chosen a, a, a hundred different verses, but I just want to point your attention to Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 29, where Jesus says, hey, to you who are willing to listen, and just right there, hey, if you are willing to listen, he's not a dictator, right? He's not forcing you or obligating you. If you're willing to listen, let me show you what I have to say, right? I say, love your enemies, pause, otherworldly right there, right? Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. What? Are you serious? Pray for those who hurt you. I mean, you can think whatever about Christians, Christianity, or the church, but you have to admit that the teachings of Jesus, there is none alike, right? If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek. Also, if someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. So regardless, again, of what you think of Christianity, you have to admit that if the world lived according to the teachings of Jesus, this would be a better place to live, would it not? This would be a way better place. So again, if you have never read the Bible before, I would, I would encourage you. I would actually challenge you this week. Just sit down, open one of the Gospels, just kind of open your Bible to the you know, the, the fourth part of it, the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, I recommend John, and just kind of read through the life of Jesus and just consider the teachings of Jesus. Number two, I would ask you to consider the miracles of Jesus. 
Consider the miracles of Jesus. And you might be here and say, I, I don't believe in miracles. Okay, but, ju but just consider, could, you know, just ask yourself, could it have happened? Could that have really happened? Could the, you know, that, that God through, right, that, that through the power of God, Jesus did certain things. The Bible tells us in, in Mark 6, verse 2, it says the next Sabbath, Jesus, he, meaning Jesus, began teaching in the synagogue. And I love this. Many who heard him were amazed. Why? Because of his teachings, right? They were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Again, you might not believe in miracles, but just ask yourself, could it be? Could it be that through the power of God, Jesus actually did the things that scripture claims that he did? Scripture claims that Jesus opened blind eyes. He, he, he opened deaf ears. He caused the mute to speak, right? He, he touched and healed the untouchable and the rejected of the time, right? The, the lepers and, and everybody else. Uh, he, he raised people from the dead. He turned water into wine. He walked on water, as a matter of fact. He multiplied bread and fish. And, and what's interesting to me is that even the retractors of Jesus, even the enemies of Jesus, the people that were against him, when you read the accounts of his life and ministry, his enemies, they never questioned the validity of the miracles. They never be like, nah, that didn't happen. That was just a magic trick. I saw him, he put it up his sleeve and he just kind of pulled it out, right? Like they didn't, they didn't like question the validity. They just wanted them to stop. Just stop doing all these things. Why? Because so many people were believing in him and were following him and walking away from the, the different religious system of the day. So even the retractors, even the enemies of Jesus, they didn't question the validity of the miracles. So consider, consider his teachings, consider the miracles. Number three, I would ask you to consider the resurrection of Jesus. Now, this is important for us because with no, without, without resurrection, there's no Christianity. Hands down. That, that's just point and it's over, right? So Christianity depends on the resurrection. So, so consider it, right? Consider it. Our faith is built on, on, on the resurrection. Now, if I'm completely honest with you, I want to just put my, hands on the, my cards on the table and tell you, that the reason that I believe in Jesus, the reason that I believe what he says, is not because of what he said, right? The reason that I believe in Jesus is not because of what he said. Now, Jesus, again, he said some incredible things, right? In the teachings of Jesus, I mean, Jesus said amazing things. And if you live, I believe that if you live according to the sayings and the the, the the, the teachings of Jesus, man, you're going to be a better person for it. But at the same time, there's been many bright and, 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 and many brilliant people throughout history, men and women that have said uh, incredible things, right? They, they, they've shared with the world incredible principles and ideas and concepts. And, and if you live according to their sayings and their teachings, you're probably going to be all right. So I want to tell you that I don't believe in Jesus because of what he said. I would also tell you that I don't believe in Jesus because of what, uh, because of the life that he lived. Not necessarily because of the life that he lived. Now, again, I believe that Jesus lived a beautiful life. I mean, it was a humble, sacrificial, and, and just a beautiful life. I mean, he loved the unlovable. He accepted the rejected. He healed and cured the lame. However, there have been many people throughout history that have lived sacrificial lives they have lived with a purpose and and they devoted their lives to these things even unto death so there have been people that have lived also amazing lives i mean obviously not compared to the sinless and perfect life of jesus but but beautiful life nonetheless so i don't believe in jesus because of what he said or because of the life that he lived i want to tell you that the reason that i believe in jesus is because of what he did now, when I say what he did, I'm not talking about just his works and his miracles. I'm talking about the fact that he was murdered. He was crucified. And three days later, he rose up and he ascended unto heaven and he is alive today. I believe that he is alive and seated at the right hand of the Father. And he is interceding for you and for me. 
and I believe in Jesus because he raised up from the dead victorious over sin, death, and the grave. And nobody has done that. Other people have come back to life, but nobody's still alive today. Nobody has ever um, done that before. Now, uh, you, you might say, well, there's no real proof for the resurrection other than the Bible, and I don't believe the Bible, so I'm off the hook. And I want to say that the Bible, Christianity doesn't exist because of the Bible. Let me just put it plainly. Christianity does not exist because of the Bible. The Bible exists because of Christianity, right? Because, look, the truth is that the, for the first 300 years of the church, there wasn't a Bible. There was just a bunch of eyewitnesses. I mean, Acts 3, verse 15, if you remember Peter, Peter was the guy that Jesus said, hey, yeah, you're talking a big game, but before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. Remember that story? And Peter denied him, and it was it was horrible, but then Jesus restored him and told him, the disciples, hey, when I leave, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and then that happened, and then here comes Peter in Acts 3.15. And if you've never read Acts chapter 3, it's amazing. But he was in the middle of a crowd, and he told people, the same guy that, that denied that he even knew Jesus in front of a middle school girl, right? The same Peter, he was like, hey, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And what does it say? We are witnesses. We are witnesses of this fact. Christianity does not exist because of the Bible. Christianity exists because their Savior died and then rose up three days later, hung out with his posse for a couple of weeks, right, like 40 days, and then went up to heaven, and they were like, yo, we got to tell somebody. The Holy Spirit came, and not decades, not centuries later, days, weeks later, they were out on the street saying, hey, you killed our Savior, but Jesus rose them up. He raised them up from the dead, right? And, and, and he is alive. And that's why Christianity exists. Now, there are some, uh, and, and also I want to mention that even today in court, one of the most powerful things that you can provide in court, what is it? An eyewitness. You got an eyewitness, forget it, right? Forget about that case. You're guilty, you're innocent, whatever, because there's nothing more powerful than a witness. And Peter said, hey, you killed them, but I saw them. And not just me, all of my buddies, all of my friends. And not just that, Jesus appeared to a group of over 500 people before he ascended onto heaven. We have witnesses. The Bible exists because of these witnesses, because after they started talking, you know, 10 years passed, 20 years passed, they kept sharing it. 30 years past, the, the gospel of Mark, which is the first gospel, is believed to be documented even 30 to 40 years after the resurrection because they were like, hey, we ain't got, we ain't got Facebook, we ain't got Twitter, we ain't got airplanes, we ain't got the internet. We better write some of this stuff down so it can stay documented and we can send those letters. And that's how we eventually got the Bible. The Bible exists because of Christianity, not Christianity exists because of the Bible. Now, there are some, some thoughts, you know, some people say, well, Jesus didn't really come back from the dead. The, the, the Roman soldier stole the body. Okay, but, you know, just if you just think about it for one instant, you would have to just discard that because when the disciples were like, hey, he came back from the dead, it would have been so easy for the guards to say, actually, no, we took the body and here he is, right? Now, some people say, and this theory is actually documented as Christian in, in, in the Bible today, and this is actually believed uh, by many Jews even to this day, that, well, it was the disciples that stole the body. The disciples are the ones that stole the body, and, and you know, they just kind of kept it a secret and, you know, took them out, kind of like weekend at Bernie's, you know, once in a while or whatever, I don't know. Uh, but the, um, the, the, that's the other theory. But if you think about that, history tells us that Judas, if you remember, Judas committed suicide. He hung himself. The apostle John, he died of old age. He was the only one that didn't die because of something horrible. Well, he was boiled in oil, and then he was thrown in an island by himself. So that was pretty horrible. But 10 out of the 12 disciples, they died as martyrs. They died because they reached the moment where they said, hey, you either deny your faith, deny Jesus, or we're going to kill you. And they said, well, bring it on, right? Because I'm not going to deny what I saw. Now, again, if you think of it objectively, 
you have to just get to the moment and get to the point where you think, I mean, do you really think, do you really think that 11 small town, average uneducated men devised the most elaborate plan, right? Uh, uh, they adapted the, the most daring plan and scheme. They pulled it off. They kept it a secret, right? All with no personal motive or gain. Instead, at tremendous personal cost, because all but one dying because of their faith, and all so they could cheat the world into being a better place. Does that sound like they would make something up for that? The, the truth is that I would ask you to consider the resurrection. If you remember, when Jesus arose, he appeared to the disciples, and there was one guy that was missing. And then when he joined, he was like, you saw who? Jesus? <laughs> Whatever, I don't believe you. Actually, I'm not even going to believe unless I see him. Actually, I'll up it. I won't even believe it unless I see him and then I touch his wounds and put my finger in his side. That's when I'll believe it. And who was it? Do you remember? Doubting Thomas, Thomas right? And, and Jesus was like, the next time Jesus showed up, like, Thomas, what up? Right? You want you, you doubting still? I'm right here. Here. Put your side. Now, history tells us that Thomas, doubting Thomas, actually went to spread the good news of the gospel to India, right? To India, a land with over 300,000 deities and idols. And again, he reached the moment in his ministry where they told him that he either renounced his faith and, de and denied Jesus altogether, or they were going to kill him. And history tells us that he didn't deny his faith. And they stabbed him. They, they just kind of skewed him with a, with a spear through his side and murdered him. Now, my question to you is why? Why would Thomas be willing to die for something that he previously doubted? Because he saw the risen Christ. Because he saw the risen Christ. He saw the one that says in Revelation 1, 17 and 18, hey, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. And that is the reason why these disciples and why these followers of Christ, they weren't afraid to die because they knew, hey, if he came back to life, then that's my hope. They actually considered it a great honor to die for their faith. As a matter of fact, the reason why they actually sent the Apostle John to be alone in some island is because they got to discover, well, every time we kill one of these guys, a thousand more pop up. Because they're like, man, this guy's dying for their faith and another hundred come up and believe in Jesus. So they're like, we're not killing no more Christians. Just put them in an island somewhere, right? Um, so, so again, they, I mean, the only explanation is that, man, he encountered the risen Savior, and he was willing to die because his because of his faith, because of the hope that he has in Christ. So I would ask you to consider the teachings of Jesus, consider the, the miracles of Jesus, consider the resurrection of Christ. And, and the number four, and to finish, I would ask you to consider the exclusive claim of Jesus. I would ask you to consider the exclusive claim of of Jesus. Now, you don't have to believe it. You don't have to agree with it. But this is what Jesus claimed. And we saw this verse already in the beginning. But it says that Jesus says, hey, I am the way. Not one way. I am the way. I am the life. I am the truth. Not one of many truths. No, I am the truth. So truth is not an idea or a philosophy or just this, this ambiguous thing. No, truth is is a person and you can know the truth you can know christ and the bible says that the truth will set you free you thought that was just a line from a movie but jesus said that right the truth will set you free and jesus says i am the life i am the way the truth and the life and no one can come to the father except through me so with this declaration the way that i see it is that we're only left really we're only left with three options. And today, I just want you to think through these and just kind of consider these. And your first option today is to just say, well, I mean, Jesus was alive. 
Jesus is just a liar. He's a really good liar. I mean, he made his disciples leave his family, leave their careers. I mean, he made them follow him for three years, and he even convinced them to die for him. But at the end of the day, Jesus is, is just a liar. Now, that's fine, and that's an option. But what we can't do at this moment is that you can't say then that Jesus was just a great moral teacher. Because if he lied his way through his ministry, then he's not a great moral teacher because he was a liar, right? Now, just putting myself in that situation, if I'm lying, if I'm lying, <laughs> and we've all been caught on this, right? It's like, well, what did I say last time? I got to remember what I said to make sure, right? If I'm lying, I'm eventually going to either contradict myself or I'm just going to kind of just cave in. And thinking about the life of Jesus, I mean, it might be fun for a little while, but maybe when they were about to whip Jesus with that cat of nine tails, I would have thought twice about it. It's like, whoa, yo, wait, you know what? I, I was just kid, man. I was just bored, right? Or, or maybe maybe he hang on. And, and they, they stroke him with that whip the 39 times. But maybe after I saw my internal intestines kind of hanging out, and now they're telling me to carry, to carry that cross. Where? Oh, heck no, right? Like, yo, you know what? I'm, I was just kidding, man. I was lying. Was, I just made it up. Or maybe you did do it. Maybe you do it and you hang on to the, because you want to prove, you're going to hang on to that lie, right? Uh, but maybe when they stretch out your arm, when they stretch out my arm and put that spike right there in my wrist, I'm like, yo, you know what? I was a carpenter and I was bored. And so if, if, if I was a liar, man, I would eventually cave in. I don't know about you, but... The other option that you're left with is you can say, well, I mean, he was just crazy. Jesus was a lunatic. I mean, he was just out there. I mean, he just really believed this thing, that he was really the son of God. I mean, he was he was just like hit, like the, a Hitler or somebody that, that they're just with this ideal, right, that they just kind of carried through and, and all these other things. But, but at the end of the day, he was just a lunatic. And again, that's, that's an option. That's an option. Or number three, I think the only option that we have is, is to then believe that Jesus was who he said he was. I think really, I think that's the only, the, the last option is that Jesus is Lord. The only option is that you say, you know what? I believe that Jesus is Lord. I mean, you can still, you can just, just kind of write him off as a liar write him off as a lunatic. You can just keep believing the cultural lie that it doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter, you know, what 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 faith system or whatever you believe. As long as you're sincere, you can believe that or you can remember, hey, the truth, the truth might cost you something. And to believe that this is true, yes, it will demand your submission, it will demand your faith, it will demand you bending your knee and, and submitting your life and your will to a God that loves you and that wants far greater things for you. So the truth, it can cost you. But a lie, it could cost you even more. It could cost you everything. So in the Bible, there's this scene where Jesus is speaking with his disciples and, and he just kind of tells his disciples that he says, hey, who do the people say that I am? Who, who, who are the people saying that I am? And, and the disciples, they were like, oh, well, some think that you're like Elijah or, or, you know, one of the prophets or this and the other. And then Jesus just kind of cut to the chase and he looked at Peter and he said, Peter, who do you say that I am? And that's such an important question because that's a question that, Every single one of us, in one moment or another, we are going to have to wrestle that question to the ground. And we're going to have to answer, who do you say Jesus is? Jesus told them, hey, who do you say that I am? Now, if you grew up in church, if, if maybe this is in your first Easter service, or you, know, you grew up around the context of, of church, or the Bible or something, you might know the right answer. You might know the Sunday school answer, right? Raise your hand. Hey, I get a star. But I'm not asking you who do you say with your lips who Jesus is. 
I want to ask you today, what does your life say? Who does your life say that Jesus is? Who does your life say that he is? Who does, who does your life say in the way that you love and treat other people? Who does your life say that Jesus is in the way that you talk and think about others, in the way that you forgive people that offend you, in the way that you approach challenges and difficulties? Who is Jesus in your life? What does your, your life say that Jesus is according to your schedule, according to your priorities, according to how you manage your finances? Who does your life say that Jesus is? Is and, and that's a personal question because I am convinced, and the reason I do what I do is because unfortunately, there are people that are in church. You might not even miss church. You're in church all the time. You know the right answers. You know the Sunday school answer. But there are people that are convinced but not converted. There are people that are convinced but they're not converted. You know the right answers. You know intellectually who Jesus is. Yeah, he's the son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the savior. But who does your life say that he is? Who do you say Jesus is? I want to tell you who Jesus is. Jesus is the one that reached down into the depth of my sin-filled life and rescued me. He is the one that forgave me of more sin than you can even imagine. Jesus is the one that touched my dark, lonely, angry, and guilty heart and replaced it with a heart of flesh. Jesus is the one that broke my chains of addiction that freed me from my guilt, my shame, and my regrets. Jesus is the one that came into my aimless and purposeless life and encountered me not with condemnation and judgment, but with his love, his mercy, his goodness, and his grace. And he gave me a calling, and he gave me a purpose to live for. He is the one that promises me that the work that he started in my life, he will carry it out to completion to make me the man that he wants me to be and honestly, the man that I want to be. He is the one that blessed me with a beautiful wife and a wonderful son that I do not deserve. He is the one that enables me and gives me the, the desire to want to love them and serve them and lead them, my family and this church. Jesus is the one that gave me this platform and the one that gives me the courage to stand before you today and encourage you to seek him, encourage you to consider Jesus, to look at the life of Jesus, not your idea of who Jesus is or Christianity or the church. No, seek him. Pray. If you don't know how to pray, pray wrong and just tell him, God, if you're real, if you're really out there, then reveal yourself to him. Seek him. Seek him. Ask him, hey, if you can really forgive me, if I can really get rid of this guilt and this shame and these regrets, then do it in my life because I believe and the Bible tells us clearly that if you seek him with all your heart, those that seek will find. Those that knock, the door will be open. If you seek God, you will find him. You will find him because he is real because he is real and because he is alive amen because he is alive so consider jesus consider his teachings consider his miracles consider the resurrection and consider is he really the only way or can i just believe whatever it is as long as i'm sincere or or is it really just him. Is he really the, the way, the truth, and the life? And remember, hey, the truth might cost you something. It will. 